There we go. Okay. Marais, would you like to do some housekeeping? We might get started with two minutes in, so uh, we might get started. There'll be people still coming on for a little bit longer, I think. Over to you, Marais. Thank you, Michelle. My name is Marais. Um, yeah, I'm just going to be sharing a few housekeeping um, items. So first of all, I do want to remind you all that we are recording the session. Um, and as Michelle has asked, uh, we'd like to ask you to keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation. Um, as for your video, you're free to do um, whatever you want, whether you prefer to keep it on or off. Um, and then last but not least, if you have any questions, we would love to hear them. Um, please pop them in the chat box as we're going through the presentation. Kylie will be monitoring all of them and we'll be recording them for the final section where we have the Q&A. Um, and then at that time, we will also be offering you the opportunity to ask a question in person. So just raise your hand and we'll be appointing you and unmuting you. So back to Michelle. Thank you, Marais. Yes. So uh, as I said, I'd just like to say thank you. Scott's about to share his screen with us. Uh, thank you for that, Scott. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, as I said earlier, we have a record 198 uh, registered, and at last count, uh, we have about 100 on board already, so uh, plenty of people on there as well. Uh, I'd first of all just like to introduce our team. Uh, first of all, myself, my name is Michelle. For those that don't know me, I'm the project director of OSMAP. I'm very excited to be a part of this amazing, unique Global First program. I'm very excited to, to have that role. Uh, we'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Scott Wilson, who's on board as well. He's operating the slides today. He's the research director and also part of Macquarie University, uh, senior lecturer there. Uh, we also have uh, Kylie there. Kylie will give us a wave. She's operations um, manager and will help moderate the, the day today. And we have Marais as well. And Marais is uh, newly on board as our digital marketing manager and social guru. Uh, and she's going to be looking at the chat room for us today. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to first of all acknowledge our founding partners that we've listed there uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, they were part of the initial inception of the program in mid-2018. So thank you very much. Some of whom are with us today, which is fantastic. Most importantly, as it is National Citizen Science Week, I'd also like to, sorry, National Volunteer Week, which are citizen scientists, that we have around 8,000 citizen scientists involved in the program. So thank you to everybody that's been involved in the program for the last couple of years. And of that, we've got around 330 uh, different types of collaborators, ranging from non-for-profits right through to government sectors. So thank you, everybody, for your input and involvement in the program to date. Uh, first of all, we're going to go on to the outline of what the day will be, what will entail. Uh, Scott will put on to that one. And okay, so we're going to go through today uh, some briefly on the problem, what, are, what OSMAP's all about, microplastics. We're also going to discuss the state of play and where we're at at the moment. Uh, we're going to go through some sources and identification and reduction strategies that we're involved with, the way forward. And we're going to finish then with a Q&A session, as Maria said. If we don't get to your questions today, that's no problem. We will certainly address them, uh, most probably on our social media, um, and we'll be able to group those questions together as well. So I'd like to acknowledge country as well, please, um, for the next slide there, Scott. Yes, so we acknowledge the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we live and work. Um, we repay our respects to those elders past, present and emerging. And I'd particularly like to, to welcome uh, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains in which I am today. For those that don't know, I'm now based over in Adelaide uh, and uh, I've been here for about a year, so it's very exciting to be, to be able to expand the program over here as well. 
So first of all, we're going to go through, there's some people on board today that haven't um, been involved with our program. And so we'd just like to introduce the problem and why the program is so important and, and the way forward for us today. So we have an absolute love affair with plastic, unfortunately. I mean, plastic was made to be durable so long ago. And these are scenes, unfortunately, that we see from time to time. Uh, my favourite is the lemons individually wrapped, oranges peeled for our pleasure. And the absolute favourite there is the bananas peeled and wrapped up in plastic on a polystyrene foam tray. It's everywhere these days. And it's something that we're, it's very evident in our environment. Move on there, Scott, would be good. There we go. And where does it come from? Well, in urban areas and built up areas generally, most of it comes from land-based sources. This is a picture where uh, previously we've spoken about that and we've used pictures that we've, we've had from overseas, but this is actually in our backyards. This is George's River, uh, a photograph taken by Tony Wales from George's River Keeper. So these are backyard scenes in Sydney Harbour. So most of it does, as I said, come from land-based sources. So that's a real concern. Obviously, that's not always the way in, in more remote areas, but certainly in the built-up areas. And these impacts are global. Uh, we're seeing it very visibly in a lot of species with entanglement. So we saw that baby humpback whale entangled off the coast of Queensland just this week. Uh, but then there's the invisible signs as well, the ingestion of the smaller bits of plastic. This is an albatross chick and in fact had over 360 pieces of plastic found in this one fledgling chick. Now you can see many of those pieces, the screen there showing all the small pieces, Scott's outlining some of those. They're not all small and that's the scary thing. There's large full-size toothbrushes, um, cigarette lighters, etc. And many of them, they're coloured pieces and so the, the parents of these chicks are out there looking for these food to feed their chicks. Uh, however, they're coming across all these different types of plastics as well. So they are global impacts. Every species just about on earth is impacted in one way or another from plastic as well. So what are microplastics? Well, we all Many of us, not everybody, but many of us are aware of the term microplastics nowadays. Uh, obviously, anything above five mils inside is what we call macroplastic. Uh, anything less than five mil down is uh, what we call microplastic. And in the OSMAP program, we look at the one to five millimetre range. Now, this is the size of about half of your little pinky in size, but we know that plastics go right down to virtually invisible that they're airborne. And some of the studies that our partners and Scott are involved with are looking that as airborne plastics uh, because we live in quite a synthetic environment nowadays. So our program focuses mainly on that. And where are they found? It's often asked to us. So things like microbeads from scrubs and detergents are quite visible, uh, that quite people know about them these days. However, uh, it's the secondary microplastics, the break up not the breakdown, but the breakup of plastics in our environment uh, that uh, lends to the secondary types of microplastics. Another thing in our environment, uh, microplastics that we found a lot, are what we call nurdles or resin pellets. So when microplastic is in the pre-production form, they're round pellets, uh, somewhat like it looks like, a, may look like a fish egg and things like that, uh, that we find in great quantities in many locations around um, the aquatic environment. Uh, over there as well is that in nanofibers, so products from fibers from our clothing, when we wash our synthetic clothes in the washing machine, they create a lot of these microfibers that unfortunately there's nothing in our wastewater treatment plants that are able to stop this microfibers from going down um, through our wastewater treatment plants and straight out into the ocean. Unfortunately as well these days our tyres form a lot of microplastics as well. They, uh, our tyres are made up of synthetic plastic, um, synthetic rubber these days and as our tyres wear uh, a lot of that gets washed down uh, through our stormwater drains and out into the ocean as well. So next slide there Scott. 
There we go. And I'll move over to Scott is now going to discuss with you some of the potential impacts or the risks to humans of microplastics as well. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And hi, everyone. <clears throat> yes, there's um, obviously amounts of plastic entering our environments, as Michelle mentioned, but what harm is there to humans, you may ask? Um, well, we know fish are eating it and we consume fish. So the natural question is, do we consume plastics? That's the, you know, the natural go-to. And <clears throat> while there's some evidence of movement through the food chain, um, there's very little evidence for human consumption. But what we do know uh, is there was a study recently done uh, which looked at uh, human poo. Uh, and found microplastics uh, in human poo. So there is now, you know, a, I suppose, garnering evidence for, for that. So we, we are likely exposed to microplastic, no doubt, either if we eat seafood or not. Um, but yeah, we know it's also in the air. So as you may have heard, there's been microplastics reported from the Antarctic to the Arctic, to the, you know, to the deep oceans. And there was a recent study actually just released last week about it um, in sea spray. So you, Robbie, down at the beach there, for instance, you know, might be getting a hit of microplastics in that sea air. But it's not just the, you know, the, um, the actual plastics themselves. There's a whole lot of contaminants associated with plastics, unfortunately. And so in this slide here, you can see that there's a range of chemicals when a plastic product is made that come with that plastic. So we're potentially ingesting you know, that as well. And unfortunately, or fortunately, because plastic, once they're in the environment, actually act like sponges. So they're sorbing a whole range of other contaminants out of the water, which is good because it takes it out of the water. But then if you're a fish or a bird, ingesting that plastic, then you are potentially getting this cocktail of chemical effect as well. So things from heavy metals uh, to kind of hydro, uh, hydrocarbons um, to pesticides and things like that. So there's a whole range of chemicals that we can, we are finding on the plastics. And I'll, I'll show you some data in a little bit of, on that. <clears throat> so, Yes, there's potential. Uh, and there was a study done by colleagues at uh, University of Newcastle who are part of the OSMAP program. Uh, and you may have seen this study came out last year where they estimated from all the studies around the world on, you know, that have shown that there's microplastics in, in bottled water and obviously in our seafood, in salts and various other food products. They estimated that we'd be consuming about five to eight grams of microplastic per week, which as the, you know, the photo shows is equivalent to eating a credit card's worth of plastic each week. Um, those numbers uh, are really an underestimate of the potential loads because all around us, the air we're breathing, as I just mentioned, you know, is, is also full of, microplastics and, and nanoplastics. So the question then is what human impacts are, that, are there from that? Um, so one, there's plastics getting in, in some amounts, although it's hard to study humans to actually quantify those loads. Um, and then what effects they're having. So we know there's chemicals on the plastics. And so we can kind of use uh, kind of a range of studies. So we use surrogate uh, experiments using, you know, other species, rats and mice and other model species, um, or cell lines, human cell lines, to test the effects of maybe the chemicals on the plastic. So we know, you know, when a plastic product is made, there's things like plasticizers or colorants in or on those plastics that, um, you know, obviously uh, come with the plastics. And so this graphic in the middle is actually from a nice paper um, and the reference is down the, the bottom. And this is actually a, a free 
for viewing paper. So you can bring your own. But what it does, it actually coalesces, you know, some of that kind of toxicological information that has been done on, as I said, surrogate species or, or um, cell lines and shown that some of those chemicals that we find, so, and it lists them there. So things like phthalates, which are a common plasticizer, we know they're an endocrine disruptor. They affect the hormone system. They affect reproduction, um, as you can see, digestion, uh, respiration, etc. So there's a range of effects that we can kind of glean from these other species that we've looked at. So the question is, we need more data. And that's kind of where uh, you know, the impacts have got to, where we're documenting the loads. Um, and obviously, you know, there's been lots of issues around plastic and it's become very much a hot uh, topic um, through, you know, the war on waste is a classic one. And obviously with the China sword policy and then refusing our waste. So there's lots of issues that have come to the fore and hence you guys here today you know, uh, uh, hopefully learning a bit more about the issues and, and, and then what we're doing. So OSMAP, um, the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project is doing to help in that scope. So I'll hand back to Michelle to uh, tell you a bit about OSMAP. Thanks, Scott. Now, before I go any further, I'm just wondering if anybody sees a square in the top of their screen. Scott, are you seeing, oh, it's gone again. There seems to be a square that keeps popping up and uh, uh, anyway, it's gone again. So I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. Yes. So thank you, Scott, for that brief overview. So let's get on to the gist of why we're here, OSMAP. Now, OSMAP is the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project. It's a unique global first uh, program and it's a nationwide citizen science program that uh, maps microplastics on our shorelines and collects scientific data that we are able to then use to map hotspots. And it's also very much involved in educating and uh, educating local communities and also high school students on these issues. And it's a really fantastic program. So what's often asked of us though, which some people aren't aware is what is citizen science? Well, citizen science is the, is the scientific research conducted by non-professional citizens. And there's different levels that uh, can be seen right from level one, which is sort of fun activities through to what we refer to as level four or extreme citizen science, which was what is we, we refer to as OSMAP. Uh, it's a great program that we have going here and why are we doing this primarily is to identify where these hotspots are and also where there are no microplastics or very few microplastics. Uh, we then look at what they are, the sizes, etc. And what we'd like to do then is to be able to use this information to identify where they're potentially coming from and then to come up with some solutions as to how to stop these problems before they enter the waterways. And all of this linked together is to uh, help with behavioural change. If we can just address these one person at a time, then uh, we're succeeding in our, in our role of, of educating about microplastics and the issues there as well. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the project's designed primarily by um, establishing regional, regional hubs around Australia, and they can consist of environmental education centres, local governments, other NGOs, local NRM groups, which we have a lot over here in South Australia who are established and trained. Those hubs then recruit different school groups and uh, different schools involved there as well and community groups. They follow those methods which we've standardised, scientific methods. That data is then recorded and that information and the microplastics are sent back to us uh, for further analysis. Uh, we then validate that information and are then able to produce our hotspot map as well, which is not going to be long away. I'll just throw that in with a bit of luck. Uh, so where can you find your closest hub? Uh, we've now um, 
put on our website a link where you can find a hub near you uh, and that's been prepared by Kylie and so from that you're able to find your closest regional hub uh, one that is trained and has kits available and trained people to help you undertake sampling in your local area we're also in the process of actually designing some online training courses as well uh, so that could help in the more remote remote areas as well so what have we achieved so far let's have a little look at that for for the last um, while so the program's been going since about mid 2018 and since that time we've uh, conducted 31 programs or training days training events around Australia from right up in Thursday Island and I know Tony's on board we went up there right down to the southwestern of Australia and to Tasmania as well so we've we've been uh, right across the country nowadays as well we've established 39 hubs from around Australia we've collected to date 350 four samples from different beaches and locations we've got around 330 different organizations involved trained almost 550 we have close to 8,000 people involved which is really fantastic and at last count that equates to about 33,000 citizen science hours so congratulations everybody with that and we've removed around 100,000 different pieces of microplastics from entering our waterways, which is a great, uh, great result considering this is done by you guys, by your community uh, from our citizen scientists as well. So the map, we, this is our uh, pet and our pet hate, I must say. Uh, so we are in the final throes of creating our interactive hotspot map. And this is Kylie's baby, I will say. And this map will be fantastic in that it's going to, you can see on there the different colored dots. And what we have is though the microplastics that's being collected broken down by color, shape, size, and type. Uh, it is nearly ready, I promise. Absolutely, Kylie, it is. And uh, with that, we'll be able to, identify where these microplastics are found. So the idea is with this hotspot, which is freely available, this hotspot map, is that people from different locations around Australia can actually uh, compare different locations. So if you're over in Perth and you want to compare to Melbourne, we can start to have a bit of a, uh, what we're calling it, a beach smackdown to see who whose beach is cleaner than whose. Maybe Byron Bay versus Bondi or something like that. So that's what we're working towards now. So we're very excited about that as well. What else have we been finding? Well, now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Scott and he's going to talk about some more of the results that we found to date. Thank you, Michelle. So this is not the interactive hotspot map, as Michelle alluded to, but it is a map of our data um, as it currently stands. Um, <clears throat> you'll see there's various coloured points on there. Um, lots of greens, lots of East Coast um, data and some big red points in Sydney and a big black point in around Adelaide. I'll talk about those in a bit more detail. So let's go around the country. Oh, so the breakdown is by state, uh, as you can see in the table there, is very much um, New South Wales centric. We have um, stemmed out of New South Wales, but now we're broadening the scope to other places and not just Australian states. So if you see back here, if I go back a slide, we've got some points off the map or off the mainland. So that's Cocos Island over there. Um, we've, got, we've got Norfolk here and we've got even some from outside of Australia. Anyway, that's the state of play. We're looking to expand in obviously uh, a lot more areas outside of those. What habitats we sampled, because OSMAP you can do on any water. It doesn't have to be just coastal or on, on the beach, um, although most of it has been on the coast um, or in, in the estuarine areas. Um, so there have been two predominant sampling areas, but you can do it in, we have some freshwater river sites and a few mangroves and obviously some offshore sites. So that's the, the breakdown. So if we have a closer look at some of that data, uh, just to show you what's happening. Uh, for Northern Australia, 
Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot uh, in the northeast of Queensland there, only a few in <clears throat> uh, around the Northern Territory. And I should point out that the, the colour coding represents a the amount of microplastics per square metre. So that's a standard metric we use. So if you took a metre of sand, that's how much microplastic on average we're getting on those beaches. So green is, is low. So zero to 10 bits of microplastic. So you can see a lot of the, the east coast of Queensland is, is green, there's a few yellow points. Um, no reds or blacks to point out there. And in the, the table, um, we've broken it down by region. So if we were to look at Queensland, for instance, then we are finding a little bit of a, a hotspot, so to speak, in the, the Burdick and Dry trop Tropics area. And in fact, the highest value we've got in the state now at present is at Lucinda, which is at about 80 uh, microplastics per square metre. So uh, there's definitely some concentration around that part. But uh, I'll also draw you your attention to the Cocos Islands, which is actually, a, uh, it's zoomed out, but it's, it's a big red spot on the map. So being in the middle of the, uh, the Indian Ocean, it gets a lot of oceanic debris and there's, um, rather than coming from the island itself, a lot of the, the debris and, and the microplastics are well worn and well weathered, telling us it's come from offshore. Um, but generally, north has been quite good. It, it's generally associated with population levels, okay? I will say, though, that we don't have a lot, even though it might be surprising we don't have a high levels around, say, Brisbane in the southeast of Queensland, um, we haven't got a lot of data from that, that part of the world as yet. So people there, please get out. Um, more data from Moreton Bay, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, please. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go from the north and go down to the southwest of Australia, where we have <clears throat> some data, particularly around you know, Perth, Fremantle, Rockingham area, and down around the southwest, around the Margaret River region. Once again, no no huge loads, but um, some interesting trends, uh, particularly around pellets. But I don't want to spoil um, uh, the, the the powder, if you like, of the uh, of Claire. So I'll pass over to Claire, who's over in WA, present from Ocean Remedy and and one of the Oz Mappers over there. So Claire, can you? Uh, get online and I'll move on to your slides. You can tell us what's happening over in WA. Okay, thanks Scott, thanks Michelle, and everyone else, welcome, hi. Thanks for having us over here in Perth. So we did our training with Michelle and Scott over here last, almost a year ago in July, and we had a really nice turnout of various not-for-profits and volunteer groups. They're all listed on the screen, I won't list them all off. Um, and you know, it's always that usual thing of we all start off very enthusiastic and enjoy the, uh, <laughs> the education that we get from that day with OzMap, but um, that hasn't yet converted to um, lots of surveying, but we're working on getting that going and we're probably getting quite close right as the uh, shutdown hit us. So um, I'll just move on to the next slide if I can there. Thanks Scott, I won't take too much of your time up. Um, so really what we've got going on is a bit of collaboration, really grateful to the local CBA group. Um, they can really get out an amazing turnout. So we've got them surveying Leighton Beach for us seasonally this year. So what we've got sort of going on over here is, as it was pointed out, it's, it's very much in Perth local distribution. So essentially we find a lot of pellets and they're coming out of the river but there's some really interesting patterns in the pellets. So if you're surveying on Bathers Beach, we get um, the more of the bio beads that are associated with aquaculture. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Uh, whereas if we survey uh, on the beaches that are further afield from the river and within the river, we get more industrial looking pellets that more look like they're for um, making plastic things from. 
say polypipe or something like that. There's some real obvious trends going on there. So um, really stoked with the collaboration with CBA, also with Sea Shepherd. Um, and we do some surveying with a local school that has a really strong marine program. So that's a really nice opportunity working on um, getting to have the teachers more educated about that so that they can be more hands on and participate in the surveys and we can uh, get more rigorous data there because when you're working with the school, it takes a few goes before you might get data that actually is valid. Uh, other than that, uh, with the great Nerdle Hunt, um, you can see Marina on screen there and also a couple, a local councillor and the state member for Bicton, uh, Lisa O'Malley, was, they were just blown away when they saw what was arriving on this, um, this sand spit that we've got at Point Walter and we did the Nerdle Hunt there and we, we didn't have to move um, each of us socially distanced, <laughs> um, pick, picked up, you know, more than 500 nurdles in an hour, just sitting there having a chat about plastic pollution and, um, and picking up these nurdles. So that was really nice to get some attention there. And hopefully we can build on that because um, certainly we need to uh, survey the entire river to try and make out the, the, uh, the source so that we can actually stop it. Because is 100% what's coming into that river is preventable. Um, and hopefully we can work on that. So I've been as far up the river as Belmont, which is past the city, um, and we can find nurdles. So what I want to do is keep us like a combination of uh, actual just observations and then adding in the um, OSMAP surveying. So looking for the nurdles when we find them survey and then see exactly how far up river it goes and then see if we can actually find out uh, where these nurdles are actually coming from. Because it'd be amazing to not only um, do the OSMAT survey, but use it to actually stop the, the problem at the source. Um, if we can pop onto the next slide there, thanks Scott. So um, where we want to go, so that's kind of what we've achieved so far. I'll just refer to that picture in the middle there and that shows you just how stark the differences are in our nurdles that we collect over here. And so it's really one, like, I get a bit of joy out of seeing the patterns that are going on but so the um nurdles to the top of the picture so we're looking at the resin pellets in the center there the ones at the top are the ones that we find at bathers beach and uh, those are the bio bead nurdles they're used in aquaculture predominantly you can see a handful of the black ones that have made it out of the river but when you're in the river the ones at the bottom are the ones that we find so with more dominance of the black nurdles so um, it's crystal clear there's really two different sources that we could be pinpointing and stopping this problem um, so what our goals are is to um, advance on the training that's been received by all those wonderful um, NGO groups that all have their own priorities, but it's really wonderful to work with them when they can bring together their workers um, and actually get some serious OSMAP surveying. And we'd like to go from the north as far as Mullaloo, which is right at the outstretch of um, Perth's boundaries, to um, Safety Bay in the south, and that would encompass the entire Perth metro region. And then also seasonal surveys as we found. So again, like um, Scott was saying, you know, here it's all local distribution, it's all coming from the local. But when we go down to Yelling Up, uh, that's the um, tip of the Lewin Peninsula. And so we get this incredible current that gives us the most amazing marine life coming from Indonesia all the way down the West Coast. And you can see in the bottom right of the screen there, the kind of plastics that we're picking up, including microplastics, including nurdles, potentially the Durban nurdles that were spilt over a year mm. ago in Africa, um, arriving in Yelling Up and, you know, just one of these incredibly beautiful places of pure wilderness. This is the edge of a, um, a national park that you can only get to with some serious four wheel driving. And there we find all this plastic that's being delivered to us. So it just shows that we're all connected by this ocean and that, you know, we need to help our neighbours out if we want to stop this problem arriving on our shores. So that's kind of the direction that we're taking over here, baby steps, um, but uh, we do what we can. Thanks guys. Thanks Claire, I'll just uh, jump in there quickly. Thank you Claire and thank you for all your hard work in the last couple of years as well. And I'm excited to say that um, we will, I'll be back over with a bit of luck in August, um, all going well with the uh, virus. We've got a couple of training days planned with, uh, if Sam's on board here, 
uh, from Keep Australia Beautiful WA chapter to do a training day in Perth. Uh, and then we're heading up to Port Hedland as well uh, in August as part of, oh, there's Sam, um, to do some more training and to do some more sampling right across there. And it'll be our first time heading up to the, the Northwest. So we're very excited. I'm very excited to get up there and join in up there. So thank you once again, Claire. Back to you, Scott. <coughs> Thanks, and thanks, Claire, for that. Yes, nice, nice directions, and yeah, I think we can get to the source of some of those hopefully in the future. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back for stage two of the OSMAP webinar. Um, un unfortunately, we've uh, had a technical glitch with the live recording, and so. We've had to, Michelle and I have had to uh, do it as a, as a pre-recorded um, for your convenience. Also, unfortunately, we're, we won't be able to get uh, Tony Wilson from the Coastal Environment Centre and Edwina Falsham from DPI to do their bits of um, this presentation. So, but Michelle and I will cover that. And if you've got any questions uh, regarding um, OSMAP or any of those other components you hear, we can pass on any questions to the respective people. So uh, let's continue on. Uh, so we're in the southeast of Australia, we've got we've got uh, a number of sites. In fact, most of the data from around Australia is in this corner. Um, there's a few points from Tasmania. <clears throat> We've recently gone into Victoria and around Melbourne um, and the Bellarine Peninsula. Um, we've got some data points for and, and we're looking to expand there. And we've had a group, um, Colleen at Warrnambool, doing a lot of work around that part of the, the coast as well. But as you can see from the map, there's quite a few points around Sydney and New South Wales. And then the other kind of larger points you can see uh, are, is in South Australia where Michelle is. And we'll talk a bit about those two areas in particular. Uh, you'll also note there's an offshore site where we've got some data from Lord Howe Island as well, which is interesting. Of course, the colors once again um, represent different loads. So if you're seeing greens, you're seeing very low levels of microplastic per square metre. If you're seeing reds or blacks, um, you're seeing high to very high loads. Okay, so let's delve in to some of those red and black spots. And the first one of those is in South Australia, and that's uh, in particular West Lakes. Uh, if you have a look at the map to the right, Westlakes is uh, an estuarine system, a modified estuarine system where we have three sites um, and this actually was brought to our attention uh, by a school group, um, had some good community involvement since then collecting data. Um, thanks Joe and Joanna uh, for that, uh, but we've got three sites around uh, the lake system, they, they all appearing as black. So they're all very high amounts of microplastic. And if we have a look at the, the graphic in the bottom left there, the bar chart, this is microplastics in uh, per square metre, uh, which is how we standardly report that. And you can see the three Westlake sites are to the right. And we are seeing um, that they are seven on average uh, to over 9,000 microplastics per square metre. So these are the highest sites we're finding anywhere in Australia. And so the highest level um, we're getting is about 9,500 at, at present. So a very, very high loads. You can compare that to some of the other sites around South Australia, which are low to very low you can't really see, but they're all um, kind of tens and twenties um, per square metre. When we have a look at the, the actual lake 
uh, system itself. You can see there's lots of industry over uh, to the, the upper right um, and also a lot of residential. And so in the, the pie chart, you can see the most of the microplastics are actually made up of foam. Um, although there's quite significant portions of hard plastic fragments uh, as well as pellets. So in the, the, the nurdles, the industrial pellets. So we suspect there's some inputs coming in from uh, industrial centers um, around this part of the West Lakes. And the foam is interesting. We think there's a number of sources. Some of those are aquatic because uh, there is a regatta center here with lots of foam marker boys. There's lots of kind of pontoons that have foam um, support. Uh, and then there's a large uh, shopping complex here, which as you probably aware that, you know, um, there's lots of foam used in uh, packaging of goods there. So a number of potential sources and Michelle is working with uh, both local councils and uh, South Australian EPA and other organisations to try and get some uh, remedies in place there. And we'll talk a bit about uh, what type of solutions might be applicable um, later on when we get to that section. So that's uh, West Lakes, which as I said, unfortunately, one of the highest places in Australia. If we move from uh, South Australia to over to New South Wales and in Sydney in particular, um, where we have kind of the densest aggregation of uh, data points for OSMAP, uh, and you can see in this map here that there's lots of different colored points, a lot of red stand out, a lot of oranges um, and a few black points as well. So it's, it's very much um, moderate to very high levels of microplastics. We're finding and that, you know, generally we're finding that across all sites, it's, it's a nice uh, relationship with population size or, or urban uh, spread that is giving us, you know, our microplastic loads. So there's a point, a case in point is that um, most of our microplastics is coming from local sources and it's coming from predominantly our, our urban sites, although there might be some agricultural inputs in places as well. And, and obviously in more remote locations, it's probably oceanographic um, sources. So yeah, so Sydney has lots of uh, potential sources, as you can imagine. We have groups collecting data. So we have the Georges River Keeper and all these sites down the bottom here, um, all the way up into the freshwater reaches. Um, we've got a program there. I've got samples in Sydney Harbour and I'll show you that. And then we've got groups uh, around the beaches, both around the eastern suburbs and the northern beaches collecting data. Uh, and councils and, and community groups um, involved in that. If we have a just a quick look at um, the Sydney Harbour area and you can see that you know once again lots of reds, oranges, a few yellows as well and what inter what's interesting to note is that most of it seems to be coming down that Parramatta River stretch. Um, so this is kind of the Middle Harbour area, the North Bridge Echo Point seems to be low. Um, so we're not seeing a lot there um, as a source. Um, and then we're wanting to get some more data on Lane Cove River system. So we're talking to some of the councils there and there hopefully going to collect us some data in the near future. I'll, I'll just point out Manly Cove here. I'll talk a bit about that in a little while as one site where we've got some historical data, um, but we've got, um, you know, obviously lots of reds and cabarita um, having lots of black or lots of <laughs> microplastic. I'll now, um, hand over to Michelle, who's going to tell you a bit about one group's involvement in uh, the sampling around Sydney. And I'll ask you to unmute yourself, Michelle. 
Thank you. I am on. All right, thank you. So this part was actually delivered uh, the first time around by Tony Wilson, who's a senior educator at the Coastal Environment Centre in uh, Sydney's north in the Narrabeen region, part of Northern Beaches Council. We've worked very closely with Tony. She's one of our trainers as well. And she's introduced the program across many of the schools that she's working with, in particular in uh, DY Lagoon, which is the photograph of the lagoon system in the middle of the page there. Uh, she's developed a number of programs based around uh, from year seven to year 11, um, science and geography. And this particular one that she's showing here is a STEM program with year seven, where she's looking at water quality within the DY Lagoon, as well as doing microplastic surveys. And she's developed a whole program, um, a fairly full day program where she's incorporated the site assessment and the procedure of collecting the data for OSMAP, as well as processing and identifying the microplastics. Uh, and she's also developed a pre-lecture that we're going to be making available uh, on our website for, the, for educators that are interested in using that as well. The next slide then shows uh, another program that she's been involved with, with one of the local uh, schools down in Manly. As Scott had mentioned, we work very closely in Manly, um, particularly with some of our community groups run by Ali Devlin down in Manly Cove. And Scott will talk about that in a little while. So this is St Paul's Catholic College. Um, uh, Tony's been working with the Year 9 kids there on all four Manly beaches and looking at um, differences in the, the quantities of the microplastics as well around those regions. And, and David, the teacher there, is very thankful for the hard work. And so are we that Tony has put in with her school programs. But she runs a great program. So if you want any more information on how OSMAP can be incorporated into your education programs across the country, we have educational resources that we've uh, developed uh, that is cross-curricular, both geography and science and also aligned to both not only the New South Wales curriculum, but also the Australian curriculum that will be hopefully up uh, within the next uh, week. So um, watch this space or contact us for more information. Back to you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Michelle, for that very informative interlude. Uh, so uh, what we're just gonna talk about now is uh, what all this data means and what we can do with it and what, what's it showing. So we're going to provide some snapshots of uh, some of you know those sites. So I mentioned and Michelle mentioned about Manly Cove. We've got a, a, a nice data set uh, going back to June 2018 uh, for that site. And in this graphic here, we've got uh, two graphs and the top graph is just showing the amounts of microplastics per uh, meter squared over time. So we've got almost monthly sampling across that time. And you can see it goes up and down, you know, 1200. The highest we've had is just over 4000. Um, it can drop down in, into the 40s as well. So um, that's interesting that, you know, and, and one reason why we asked for at least quarterly sampling um, at any site is to give us this kind of seasonal or variance uh, over time. The more the better, of course. Um, so if you are interested or, or um, looking at a potential site, um, we appreciate any data you can, you can provide us, but uh, the more the better, of course, it helps us understand the trends better. The second graph down the lower end of that slide uh, is what I think is the more interesting data in, in that same, so it's the same beach, it's the same time span, um, but what it's illustrating is the, the amounts, the proportional amounts of uh, the main plastic groups, microplastic groups we're getting there. So in the, the mauvey purpley colour, we've got a hard fragments, and in the red, we've got foam. Uh, and so they're the two major microplastic types we're finding at Manly Cove. And what we're finding is, as you can see there, that it jumps around uh, throughout the year, not static. Um, and we're seeing some interesting trends which appear to be repeating um, from year to year now um, that 
you know, around the middle of the year, the cooler months, we're getting an increase in foam. As you can see in 2018 and 2019. Um, and then at, in the warmer months, we're seeing you know, a, a spike in, in our hard plastic fragments. So you may be asking why this is so, as Julius Sumner Miller once said. Uh, so we think it's weather related, uh, predominantly that's influencing factors on the beach. And we can look at other issues uh, in terms of the microplastic size, the color also tells us something about these trends and then the age of the plastic as well. Um, all of this is information that you uh, help gather for us and we try and interpret. Um, but it, it, we know that, you know, obviously the weather changes with seasons, uh, the prevailing wind changes around from the southeast uh, to, to a more west. Um, and so at certain times of the year, we're thinking that the weather is blowing uh, rubbish up the harbour and other times it might be blowing um, more uh, oceanic uh, based um, sources of rubbish in and so at those times we're thinking that um, a lot of the hard plastic is coming actually from outside because that hard plastic in some instances is is well weathered um, and has fouling on it so there's some some interesting little um, trends there coming out uh, we'll also note that in the harbour, when we do have foam, high foam, we're also getting high, higher pellet. So the industrial pellets, which is this green line down the bottom, which tells us, and they're coming from, you know, the, the catchment sources, the, the industries that are making or using the plastics. So there seems to be a trend there that when the wind's blowing at a certain direction, or there's maybe more rain events, that we're getting more foam and more pellets coming into the harbour and then that's coming on to, to Manly Cove just because of its position. So that's really an illustration of what you can get out of the data. Obviously, we're still trying to understand that whole picture, um, but I think it's a nice story. The other thing we do with the data uh, or our, we, in conjunction with uh, our collaborators. So one of the partners in OSMAP is the University of Newcastle uh, and Fava Palanasami and his group up there are doing some really good work on contaminants um, associated with the plastic. And what you're seeing in the graphic here is the, the polymer types of the plastic. So whether it's a polyethylene or a polypropylene, polystyrene, we can tell by using some kind of fingerprinting, um, using some ana analytical techniques and these graphs in the middle here really just illustrate uh, the signature of, of those types of polymers. Uh, but I think more interestingly, what's coming out of the data is the contaminants we're finding in and on um, those microplastics. And here's a snapshot of just uh, a, a few of the sites uh, that we've got data from. So they're all from around Sydney at this stage. So Athol Beach and Manly are both harbour sites, Kokor Lagoons on the, the northern beaches and Botany Bay down south. But what we're seeing is uh, kind of elevated levels of metal um, on different uh, uh, at different sites and interestingly our Manly Cove site which has quite high uh, levels of plastic but has relatively low amounts of contaminants on the plastic and so uh, once again it tells us maybe the, the, the age of those plastics is is less um, so generally the longer uh, the plastic spends in the aquatic environment, it'll you know, absorb uh, more contaminants. And I'll point to the Athol Beach site, which um, is interesting because it's further up the harbour, but uh, we're, we're finding higher levels at Athol Beach. And in particular, this orange point here with the red line um, for the copper concentration is indicating 
cement quality guideline for for that metal. So there's no there's no guidelines for how much you know, plastics should be out there or how much contaminants there should be on plastics. Um, so you can use we're using surrogate measures and sediment being a similar kind of matrix uh, to to the plastics where we're showing that the copper found on the plastic is more than double um, that of the what would be considered a safe or a trigger value to to trigger a response by an agency to do something if they found that level um, in the sediments. So these are all concentrations in parts per million, by the way. Um, I'll also just point out that um, the University of Newcastle team also analysed some just raw plastics, if you like, um, and found that even you know the, the base load of some of some metals um, is you know um, relatively high um, in for some of those products. So we need to take that into account that what they're coming with um, and then what they're absorbing is is definitely um, greater than what they start out with. So there's some interesting trends. We're wanting to uh, obviously get some more data from uh, sites around Australia. So once again, when you send us your plastic samples to, to check and verify that they are microplastics, we also send them off for this further analysis. So that's all important in our program. And then that leads to understanding, you know, the potential harm and the risks um, to the ecosystem from these types of plastics. So that leads us on to talking a bit about the source identification and, and you know, what we can do about reducing these microplastics. And one example, and Michelle's already mentioned this with DY Lagoon, um, we've been working with uh, Northern Beaches Council uh, and New South Wales EPA on a, on a particular project uh, where we're trying to understand the sources and, and, and work at obviously reducing those sources. So I uh, from Macquarie University do some work last year where we did some capture. So we know DY Lagoon's a hot spot for contaminants and what they did was kind of uh, use some netting and trapped what was coming out of individual drains or um, stormwater pipes. And this is just some of the data but what it's showing you and, and the map to the left here uh, the different colours represent the different land use types. So this kind of mauvey pinkish colour is uh, light industrial centre at Chroma. And so the percentages uh, there represent how much of the total that we're finding in the bottom of the lagoon um, those drains represent. So obviously just as a fraction that drain is contributing to the, the total loads because there's lots of drains coming in. Uh, but more interestingly, we're finding is that the plastic signature or the makeup of the plastics, microplastics coming out of those drains is quite unique. And so in that, for instance, at Chroma Light Industrial Centre, we're finding pellets and foams predominantly. Um, while in the uh, residential area, we're finding hard fragments and then over in the, the high density residential and the commercial district, the DY shopping centre, uh, we're finding uh, high levels of film. So wrappers and bag fragments and things like that. So we're, we're, understand, we're trying to understand the sources of that by doing um, those uh, types of sampling. And as I said, we're working further this year uh, with the council and EPA to, to get to the sources. And one of our partners on that is the Clean Water Group. And so we'll be installing some drain buddies uh, to look further up catchment, not just at the end of the pipe, but actually what's coming off the roads and, and trying to attribute sources. And, and then also get some education and awareness packages going that are quite specific to local neighbourhood communities. 
So that's one program. And that nicely links into uh, this other work that we've been doing. So the clean water group do I have a whole range of uh, stormwater mitigation devices. And one of the ones they have, and maybe see it in the photo in the top left here, is a thing called a drain buddy. So it's, a, it's an insert into the uh, stormwater pits. Uh, and so it collects not only the macro, but it also collects some micro down to uh, one millimetre. So uh, we've uh, been looking at a couple of the examples of what those traps collect on, from the micro phase. And this is just some of the data from the traps they have um, in around central Queensland and they've got traps all over Australia. They've got a large program down around Melbourne uh, called Strain the Drain, um, but they're um, obviously working uh, wherever there's uh, issues on, on controlling um, gross pollutants. So uh, the, the graphic in the bottom left is the kind of comparison of macro to micro. So it really gives us an idea just by number of the, the amounts of micro we're getting relative to the amounts of uh, macro items. Um, so that tells us something. And then when we have a look at the micro debris, and it's not just microplastics in this case, it's a whole range of other things. So, you know, glass fragments, metal fragments. Um, so, but once again, these are individual drains. We've just taken one sample and, and analyzed that. Uh, and so you can see this Rockhampton site had lots of paint um, fragments, while the Gladstone site had lots of glass fragments. Um, the Yapoon site had a mix of hard plastic and paint. So really tells us something about what's happening in the quite specific um, catchment area. So that's another uh, program we're working closely with the clean water group um, on. And then we go from kind of the land based controls and, and mitigation measures to sea based or, or water based measures and the sea being group you may have heard about. Um, they have these floating uh, bins for the ocean or for the calm waters in, in your harbour or bay or lagoon. Um, and they are basically filtering what's floating on the surface into that um, mesh basket you might be able to see there. So once again, um, they, the mesh size on that is, is down to two millimetres. So it's collecting not just the big stuff, but also um, some of the small stuff. So you can see there's some straws and wrappers and things like that. Um, and once again, uh, some students of mine at Macquarie University have been working on assessing the micro loads um, in the sea bin. And you can see some images of fragments and pellets they've collected at one of the sites in the bottom left. And then three sites they've been evaluating within the Sydney Harbour region or Parramatta River. Uh, and the, the differences, once again, in the makeup of those, um, those bins in trapping um, microplastics. So yes, they are effective. Um, and once again, by site, there's a different signature, plastic signature. But more interestingly, we're finding that the students also compared um, the sea bin data to local OSMAP data from nearby shorelines. So remember OSMAP's collecting on the high tide mark. So what washes up on the, from, from the water onto the, the shores, while the sea bin is collecting that floating debris. Uh, and this bottom right graphic is really illustrating uh, the comparison of OSMAP data uh, in proportions by type um for uh, to the to the sea bin data and so what we're seeing is a very nice correlation between what's found in the sea bin to what we're collecting on our osmap um, shorelines so there's some nice synergies there and it was a really 
good correlation uh, between between those. So we're finding, at least at this site, this is uh, just for one site. Um, at other sites, you know, it could potentially be different. So CBIN is another potential uh, remediation tool, and and I think you know what OSMAP is trying to do is not only just collect the data and analyze that, but also get to the solutions um, and what you know we can implement to, to stop it you know impacting on our environment. So this is um, one of those ones that I think along with you know the clean water group and the, the drain buddies you know are, are nice um, bits of tools in, in the overall picture. Now this is where Edwina from New South Wales uh, DPIE would have come in and, and given her spiel um, but I'll give it for her as best I can. So uh, the, the government agencies along with uh, Southern Cross Uni and Tangaro Blue have been working on this key littered item study. So it's um, been mostly focused on marine debris, so the larger items. And they've been working in uh, both urban estuaries and remote locations and, and looking at trying to document the changes at time in relation to some key um, policy uh, changes that have happened in New South Wales over that period. So there's some nice baseline data and some ongoing uh, monitoring uh, programs that they've got. They've also been uh, doing some OSMAP sampling as well so that they can compare to uh, the macro to micro and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, uh, back in 20, early 2018, the container deposit, deposit scheme came in in New South Wales, that return and earn scheme. Um, and so what Edwina and her team have been doing is, is looking at the volume of, of kind of those key items, those beverage related items uh, over over that period and what they're seeing all that this graphic is showing you is the change in volume over a thousand square meter area uh, over the you know, different uh, quarters since the scheme's been in place and so for the most part there's been a reduction so uh, you know a reduction a negative um, to, to the pre-CDS volume average, which is that blue line through there. So most of those are well below each, each um, bar represents a different location. Uh, there's a, a few spikes, but they, uh, Edwina relates back to, you know, large rainfall events or significant events that had um, obviously influence what was coming out of the catchment at that time. So some interesting trends there that are showing that, you know, the, the, the amount of those littered beveraged items uh, are a lot less than pre uh, the container deposit scheme. So that's a, a very positive result. Also with the voluntary bag ban that came in mid 2018, um, you know, those shopping bags uh, were removed from our major supermarket chains. And what we're seeing uh, in the graphic is uh, the before um, levels of bags found in the survey and then the after. And so you can see once again, significant reductions in these gray shopping bag, gray and white shopping bags um, in the environment, both remote and um, near um, urban estuaries. So once again, a positive result of the, you know, changes. These are obviously voluntary bans, um, but they've been, had a very significant impact on um, the environment. So two positive outcomes. Uh, also when uh, Edwina and team have been out sampling, and this is Edwina here, if 
sitting down on the right in the photo. Um, they've been surveying microplastics as well using the OSMAP method uh, and looking at, and this is our, the Meadow Bank sample, which I showed some results from earlier. Um, and so when we look at those two, and this is just data from Meadow Bank, um, there's some interesting trends that the, the makeup of the microplastic load is in, in most parts different to that of the macro, which is not surprising. Um, because uh, So with the micro, we're only collecting along that, that strand line while uh, the macro is collected throughout that whole intertidal range of the, the mangrove area where they collected it at uh, Meadowbank. There are some similarities in, in hard fragment levels, um, but the uh, higher levels of film uh, and, and soft plastics is because it's trapping on the, the new metaphors, the, the mangrove roots um, throughout before it gets up to that, that high tide mark. So we, we can kind of explain that. But some interesting comparisons. And once again, um, it's important to, to do those comparisons between your micro and your macro because it does help in um, understanding your, your total um, potential impact that's going on at a site. So thank you, Edwina, for sharing that data. Okay, now I'll hand Miguel uh, to wrap up and tell us the way forward with Ozmap. Michelle. Thank you, Scott. Great information there. And as Scott pointed out so pertinently that Ozmap is about um, identifying where those hotspots are and where there's very little found and having a look at that relationship between the big and the small, but also being able to, once we find those hotspots, to come up with some realistic and achievable remediation strategies that we can put forward to, for local areas. So, so that's what the program's all about. So we're really excited about that. So the way forward for us now, um, just one quick slide on that, just to overview what we've done. If you wanna get involved, please contact us. And actually since this, um, it's now a week since we gave our first delivery of the webinar, and we have had contact with lots and lots of people. So thank you very much. Um, be, rest assured we will be in touch with you. We are a very small group uh, and, uh, and so we're always looking for help in every, every kind of way, whether it's to come and help doing field work, uh, doing some sorting and analysis and identification with Scott in the lab at Macquarie University, being involved with us in one form or another, please get in touch. It's, uh, we can always use the help. If you are trained, uh, it's very important. You can get out there and with your kit, as long as you're social, uh, social distancing, and we've had this conversation with a couple of people this week as well, uh, you are able to keep that social distance and uh, get out there and grab some samples because we are still processing and it's really important to build up our map. You may also have uh, identified in the last couple of days that our map is now up. We now have the map in OzMap, so we're very excited and, and a special thanks to Kylie for all her hard work with getting up that as well. We're very excited about that. And it's really important that it's not a full map yet. Uh, your data will get up there. Um, uh, so in the next couple of weeks, we should have that up as well. If you are an educator, whether you're an environmental educator or a teacher, we have educational resources, as I mentioned earlier, that are available, will be available, and they're being currently updated. Uh, and so they'll be available for use uh, with either depth studies, environmental earth sciences, geography or other forms of sciences, they can be incorporated into your teaching. And as Scott has shown with our program, we have effective uh, strategies for your plastic pollution problems. So um, get in touch with us, we're happy to help further. And if you wanna know more, check out our socials. Uh, you would have seen yesterday, Scott and Kylie were out collecting data down at Airport Beach in Sydney and they came, the, the results were unbelievable. So that'll be very interesting. That'll be a new black spot on our map very soon. So if you wanna keep in touch, check out our socials and Marais is doing an awesome job with that as well. So uh, on that note, we'll sign off. Thank you so much for joining us. We really hope that you've learned something new about OzMap, about the program, about microplastics in, uh, in general, and uh, we'd love your involvement. So please get in touch. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, Scott. 
and until next time, see you later.